I'm Carolyn Samney, and uh, I know some of you on the webinar. And for those who I do not know, I am one of the partners and co-founders at The Pillars. We are an organizational effectiveness consulting firm specializing in organizational transformations, uh, change leadership, um, organizational development, leadership development, and executive coaching, and have been working in the area for a number of years, and The Pillars has been in existence for now going on eight years. So I don't know if we have Emit uh, with us. Emit, are you on the line? So I think Emit might be having some technical difficulties. Can I ask you all to just maybe um, to ensure that the sound is okay? Can you, can a few people just let me know, unmute yourselves and let me know if you hear me? Can we? Okay, great. Hey, uh, Caroline, can you hear me? Yes, but with a very big echo. <laughs> All right, I stopped out. I was actually on the on the phone, and unfortunately, for whatever reason, you couldn't hear me. But okay. here we go. So, uh, sorry for the technical difficulties up front, but let me introduce myself. My name is Amit Patel, and I'm the founder of Mithurst Group. We're a boutique management consulting firm that specializes in organizational transformation and effectiveness. Uh, our core competencies lie in the area of strategy planning, organizational transformation, leadership development, and talent management. Uh, we work with Fortune 500 as well as startup companies, and have, we have been in existence for the past 15 years. Great, thank you. So we're gonna spend the next hour giving you a bit of context and helping to understand where and how this model came to be, framework I should say, and go through a little bit of the, what we call four phases or pillars. It's not a linear model, but you'll understand more as we go through and give some time at the end for wrap up comments, questions, or, or any Q&A. Uh, Amit, would you like to add anything? Uh, Carolyn and I decided to, or embarked upon the journey of creating this framework primarily because of our shared experiences where we use multiple frameworks but were not quite satisfied that it fully addressed our clients organizational transformation needs specifically as it pertains to the areas of culture merger and acquisitions and such uh, we found that this framework has three key guiding principles if you will one of them is co-creation and ownership in today's economy change is inevitable and the challenges faced by the clients, no two clients are alike in terms of the challenges that they face. We consensuously engage with our clients up front so that we understand the specific organizational and transformational needs and challenges so that we can partner with them in developing pragmatic and actionable solutions that ensure their long-term and sustained growth. By instilling the principles of co-creation and ownership with our clients, we alleviate any ambiguity associated with uh, roles, responsibilities, and accountability. Simply put, our philosophy is that we partner with clients to make change rather than do change to them. And by that we mean we strive to be very objective in our recommendations and the solutions that we offer versus being prescriptive and in what we have to say. Uh, the second key driver for us, or the guiding principle, is culture. Culture is the DNA of an organization that determines how employees behave, the values employees hold, and the way in which work gets done. I'm sure some of you may have heard of the old saying, culture eats strategy for lunch. That still rings true today. Management gurus and CEOs alike attest to the fact that one of the most important drivers that will not only a drive success and continue to sustain success is culture. Uh, in a recent study done by Deloitte in 2002, culture in the workplace, they indicated nine out of 10 executives believe that culture is a significant driver for business success. Our framework is mindful in of the existing culture, but we explore opportunities to strengthen that as the company evolves. I mean, the culture is not stagnant and we help facilitate that process of revolution. Uh, an example of a good in a culture would be Google. You know, I'm sure you all have heard about Google and how it strives for innovation. The underlying culture that supports innovation 
is uh, is key in the sense that it empowers its employees, percolates ideas, promotes entrepreneurship, and learning and learns from failures. These are key characteristics that drive the culture of the of the organization to become a winning one, specifically as it relates to innovations. Uh, culture is also important when you consider mergers and acquisitions or divestiture. What is the future state culture going to look like? A number of times when, when we as change practitioners get involved in organizational transformation efforts, uh, the culture becomes a nascent. You know, we, we don't spend adequate time or the company does not provide us the opportunity to define what the future state culture is. Needless to say, culture helps accelerate or restrains an organizational transformation. The third guiding principle that we have is that we take a holistic approach uh, to the organizational transformation. We are not linear, but we are a rather fluid framework that focuses on outcomes and not deliverables, and that is a key differentiator for us. Uh, as Caroline alluded to, our organizational transformation uh, has four key areas. The first one being cultural, uh, strategic and cultural alignment. Second one being leadership alignment. Third one being organizational alignment. And the last but not least is the employee alignment. We firmly believe that the sum is greater than the parts. Strategic and cultural alignment serves as a, as a North Star for us. Without having it as a starting point, the other areas would be more difficult to align. We recognize change is challenging, and as many of you have gone through these organizational transformation, chaos and complexity is a natural phenomenon. Rather than ignoring them or minimizing them, we embrace them. A recent study by Harvard Business in Review indicated that 75% of change initiatives fail. One of the primary reasons for this failure is state and can be categorized in the bucket of strategic and cultural alignment. Any questions? All right. Uh, whole system thinking. So before we delve into what is whole system thinking, I think it would be uh, prudent to discuss what, uh, what we mean by a system. We define a system as an organized collection of parts or subsystems that are integrated to accomplish an overall goal. For instance, you can consider human beings as a system. The subsystems being arms, legs, eyes, nose, etc. The well-being of the human being as a system is predicated and directly uh, dependent upon the health of the individual subsystems, that is the arms, the legs, etc. There's also an interconnection between these subsystems in the sense, for instance, if you have a back pain, it may impact your arms, it may impact your head, and perhaps give you a mild headache. So having described that, let's delve into what we mean by whole system thinking and whole system organizational change. Whole system thinking is a method to understand how elements and systems are interrelated and how they influence one another within a whole. Whole system organizational change involves a holistic view of what is happening in an organization by utilizing larger group methods that allow for widespread, widespread participation in the change process. So when you're thinking about the change, it's just not thinking through a myopic lens about a particular group or where the change initiated, but thinking about all the synergies that it has and influ influence <coughs> impacts it may have in adjacent line of businesses. For instance, uh, if something changes in billing within an organization, how does it affect the finance, financial system? How does it affect payment? How, it, how does it affect the, the budgeting and, and so on and so forth? Uh, system thinking focuses on a, a cyclical rather than a linear cause and effect. And when we understand the components of systems and relationships between them, we can begin to understand what affects them and how to shift them into better patterns. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by linear thinking and whole system thinking. Uh, uh, linear thinkers are myopic. They focus on component pieces. They're more focused on the cause 
and its effects. They're concerned with placing blame and trying to create <coughs> order and trying to control chaos to create order. Whole system <coughs> thinkers think broader. Uh, they're concerned with the process, the underlying dynamics, to try to identify patterns and look for root causes and how to solve them, solve for them, I'm sorry. They evaluate the pros and cons of the different solutions they generate and provide a holistic solution that is beneficial not only to them, but the rather as a whole. Uh, when talking about host and thinking, it, it, the, the, the approach and philosophy is that the implementation of the organization needs to happen at a wide enterprise level rather than in piecemeal. Some of the key elements that, need, uh, that comp uh, comprise of the organizational uh, whole system thinking change process is culture, and by this we mean uh, what are the organizational structures to support the change, strategy, what is the roadmap that is being put forth, uh, the organizational design, the people, you know, what are their values, systems, what motivates them, tasks and processes, and then technology uh, in terms of how uh, it can advance and help alleviate some of the challenges faced by the organization. Some examples of whole system thinking, I'm sure you, some of you may have heard of the name uh, Kimberly Clark. When Darwin Smith, the CEO of the company, took over uh, Kimberly Clark, he found that the company was focused on paper manufacturing. However, he wasn't sure whether that was the future of the company. In having discussions with his executive team, some of which were painful dialogues, they refocused their change vision and the company's objective from being in manufacturing to getting to making an entry into product. Clinics and Huggies are the outcome of that change vision. Another example of whole system thinking is Costco and organics. Costco realized one of the biggest barriers to being able to provide organic or to meet the, uh, the, the consumer's need for growing uh, organic food was a supply chain. They recognized that they had no control in the existing model to support the demands made by the consumers. So they, they decided to invest in organic producers themselves directly, which increased their relationships with both the consumers and suppliers. And by making this financial investment today, they, they expect that the guaranteed supplies of organic products will make them profitable in the near future. Any questions? Uh, may, something I would just maybe add to this is one of the reasons why we wanted to bring whole systems thinking into the framework is that traditionally a lot of organizations when they're embarking on a transformation do look very linear. They want quick fixes. A lot of us have been in experiences or organizations where results are what are, you know, um, rewarded. So quick results are, are deemed more necessary than the right results. And this is what I think plays into a lot of this, what we hear the continual 75% of change initiatives not succeeding to their full extent is we're, we're going for short-term fixes that don't really get to what it is that's ailing the system as a whole. We want to solve, a we, we want to do Band-Aid work. And unfortunately, a lot of our organizations reward Band-Aid work. We don't reward long-term sustainable action. We're very much often quarterly thinkers. We think for the next quarter. We don't think for, for longer-term health of an organization. Okay, so that being said, I will draw on what uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier, Amit, about how we bring culture into the framework. Um, culture is a word that we hear a lot about, and it's been buzzed a lot throughout a lot of literature, a lot of different now models and whatnot we see. Um, the experience we've had is that quite often it is used as more of a theoretical tool, but very rarely applied in a meaningful way. 
So when we talk about transforming of any sort an organization, whether it's, uh, you know, like you mentioned earlier, Amit, it could be as large a merger and acquisition, it could be restructuring an organizational department. Um, we don't think about what it is that frames the organization and, and the culture is what frames us. It's who we are. It's what we believe. One of the great examples I often like to give is I've worked a lot with clients who said, you know what, we need to no longer be siloed. We need to become more agile. We need to be flexible and we need to get quick to market. And if we continue to work in silos, we're not going to get to where we are. So we're going to change our organizational structure. We're going to move from being siloed to being matrix. Now, that sounds really good in principle because it's a very noble kind of um, objective. The problem is the culture, for example, had been built to be hierarchical and had been built to be more, let's say, command and control. Everything was set up to reward the siloed behavior. So having this vision or this dream of becoming matrix is wonderful until you start to understand that the DNA of the organization tells us that we are uh, deemed to behave in a different way. We've been taught to behave in a more siloed way. So the, the change vision now is clashing with the culture. And so how do we make the culture more evident? How do we bring life to it so that as we start to think about how are we going to transform this organization, we have to have very honest conversations about what is it in the culture today that either will fuel this transformation or will actually drag us down. This part of transformation, in our experience, has been sorely overlooked. And if it's brought into the conversation, it's brought in at a very high level uh, discussion and yet kind of parked aside. So we're saying that this is one of the key drivers in, in our framework. Um, and why do we call it change emotional intelligence is, again, our experience working in this field for many years is, um, you may or may not have heard of emotional intelligence, but in a nutshell, just to give you a high-level overview, it's about the ability to identify and manage your own emotions and those of others. It's also generally about three major skills. It's emotional awareness, the ability to harness those emotions, and then bring them into application. So whether it's you know in solving problems and thinking and managing others, and it's something that comes into large, large dosage when you're going through a transformation because EI is a tool that's going to help you anticipate what's going to trigger your emotions. Change tends to be very stressful. It creates a lot of anxiety within people, within a system. And again, there's a lot of models out there that do speak about psychological components of change, transitional factors, and how to manage all that except what we don't talk about is as an agent of change who you are as a person coming into a situation whether you're the leader or someone who's been assigned to undertake this change initiative who are you as a person what are your capacities what are your triggers your emotions your beliefs um, your mindset and your paradigms will also guide the choices you make around how you design something, how you design a process or a strategy. A leader who has low EI, we've seen clear links with their inability to lead through a change process. Because picture if you are with someone who has very low empathy, the inability to hold space for people who are going through something difficult and or not able to self-regulate themselves. I don't know if you've ever experienced someone who has what we might call a short fuse and who you know you have to sort of tiptoe around. This doesn't garner a lot of um, trust and it doesn't garner the desire to want to follow someone who shows very low EI. And where we think EI plays into organizations as well is that it also can be part of who we are as a culture. Are we an organization that shows high empathy? Are we open to collaboration? Is it okay to express emotions at work or not? Because all of these factors will also determine how successful your transformation will be. 
Low EI in any three or all three of these components, meaning whoever the agent of change is, the leader, leaders of the change, and in the organization as a whole, will make it more challenging to come to a successful um, organizational transformation. Any questions or any comments or thoughts on this? Okay. So we will give you um, the high level overview of the framework. Um, like mentioned earlier, we do have sort of a, a pillar approach to it. We are here seeing numbers on each of these bubbles, but these numbers were more anecdotal just to be able to highlight which uh, pillar we're speaking of, but it really is not in a linear fashion. Except, as Amit noted earlier, we do strongly believe that without strategic and cultural alignment, the other pillars are going to be more difficult to have in, in a real good, um, effective fashion. So, I'm going to let Amit start us off with um, the first components of the framework. Uh, so, let's start with the first pillar, so it's where no pun intended, uh -huh. <laughs> of what we mean by strategic and cultural alignment. Now, there is a deep intertwined relationship between strate strategy and culture. A strategy defines where the company wants to go, how it's going to get there, etc. But at the end of the day, it's the culture that drives the behaviors of the individuals so that the strategy whether it's successful or not, is based on those emotions and the culture that's prevalent within the company. Having said that, let's take a quick look at what we mean by strategic alignment. By this alignment, we mean that there is an enterprise-wide involvement and agreement in defining the burning platform for change. I'm sure some of you may have experienced change projects where you're called in uh, when the project is in flight and have had little or no influence in getting this alignment. We firmly believe that getting this alignment right helps the other three pillars and thus help a successful organizational transformation. The strategic alignment directly ties back to one of our framework's key tenants and working guiding principle, which is whole systems organizational change. The strategic alignment helps address why the change is needed, who will be impacted by the change, how will the enterprise-wide stakeholders be engaged, what resources and leadership commitments are needed to support the change, and when will the change be impacted or implemented, and by whom. On a recent engagement, we were brought in inside to do a uh, assessment of a training group. Uh, the chain sponsor had a very different view of what the end objective was versus what the senior executive wanted. We discovered that when we were doing our stakeholder interviews and going through the process. Had we had the opportunity of using the framework up front by involving all the users and thinking holistically, we would have found out that the end goal that the executives wanted was a strategic uh, assessment of the training group rather than what we were led to believe because uh, of where we came in and that was an operational and tactical assessment. Needless to say, there was lots of cost correction that was required, and there you go. Now, let's talk a little briefly about cultural alignment. By cultural alignment, we are referring to the organization's existing capability to support strategic change. And if there are gaps, how will they be bridged? The cultural alignment helps address key questions such as, does the fundamental beliefs and values of the employee incorporate into the strategic vision. And by this, we mean the future state vision. What is the organization's change readiness? Do they have the right organizational structures, capabilities, and competencies? 
leadership in place. Uh, are practices, policies, procedures in place to support the change or the transformation? And to put it candidly, when the culture is aligned, everybody wins. Uh, you know, cultural alignment is how, you know, uh, is how the organization manipulates, redirects, or recreates the shared beliefs in such a way uh, that it drives real behaviors of the organization to be successful. Uh, an example of cultural alignment, and this is one of my favorite examples, is Tony Heesh, CEO of Zappo.com, uh, understands this very well, what it means by cultural alignment. He offers $3,000 to employees to quit, no strings attached, if they don't love the company's culture. And when you think about it, this is very astonishing and yet a genius talent management practice. We are those who don't fit the culture before they become a thorn in your side. Surprisingly, less than 3% of folks take the money and run, and the remaining employees are more committed to the company's mission and their role within it. Any questions? Um, Amit, if I can just maybe um, sort of just add a little something to this um, before possibly any questions. Um, in, in terms of also the cultural alignment, it's wonderful that people stay because they truly believe in the culture. And so when you're talking about where you're shifting the organization to, the question also is, does the culture we have today, like I mentioned earlier, fit where we're headed for tomorrow? Um, so even on the strategic alignment, you know, you, you mentioned the fact that if we don't have clarity, it's going to bring drag down. Um, there was a recent and another just quick example uh, on a mandate we were working on where initially they said to us that the mandate was that they were changing their IT structure. Um, we insisted on having all the executive leadership in the room. And upon various conversations and different discussions, we saw that there was actually a gap in the visions. We had half the room that believed that they were doing an IT transformation and the other half that believed they were doing a cultural transformation of the organization. Um, it was a good thing that the project did not start with a complete misalignment on where the organization was going. It would have brought a lot of drag down, a lot of money spent, a lot of time and energy spent on um, what would have then been a lot of tension. So this organization actually ended up spending three months bringing in key stakeholders until they finally got to a place where there was alignment on where the organization needed to go. It sounds like a lot of work up front, but one of the things we have seen time and time again, it's a lot better to invest that time up front rather than burning one, two, three million dollars and then realizing that your initiative is not going anywhere and either completely canning it or completely downsizing it to something that you never meant it to be in the first place. So, sorry about that, but any other questions <laughs> as Amit was asking? All right, there you go, Amit. <laughs> All right, the second pillar is leadership alignment. Uh, you know, by leadership alignment, we refer to the extent to which leaders are on the same page about what the change is, why it is important, and what their role is in supporting the strategic vision and the organizational transformation. It is the organizational leaders' capacity, capabilities, and visibilities to proactively support and sustain the organizational change. The leadership alignment directly ties back to one of our key uh, tenants of the framework, which is emotional intelligence. And by that we mean uh, whether the leadership is self-aware. That is, do they have the ability to read their own emotions, recognize the impact, and use their gut feelings to, to guide decisions? The ability to harness and control the emotions to the adapting circumstances you know organizational change obviously is challenging and a lot of us go through um, oftentimes the five emotional stages uh, as identified by 
Kubla, you know, anger, depression, etc. How do you harness that energy in a positive way uh, is what we are referring uh, here. Social awareness also is a key ingredient of emotional intelligence, and that is the ability of leadership to sense, understand, react to others' emotions while comprehending social networks. And, 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 being, and by that we mean, uh, is, the youth, is the leader empathetic and compassionate? What kinds of mechanisms, tools do they use in order to build relationships, influence and inspire, and develop others while managing conflict? Simply put, the organizational leadership alignment is the ability of the leadership to not only talk the talk, but walk the talk. Now, how often have we seen organizations, organizational leaders saying something, but are unwilling to do, them, do things themselves? Now, have any of you participated in such a, or experienced such a, uh, such a thing? I can share one story. Uh, it is during the dot-com days, and uh, it was in order to reduce operating costs, everybody was asked to go into a virtual office space, which is that you no longer had a designated office if you're an executive, manager, and above, uh, that you would have a, sh a cubicle that you'd have to sign in for whenever you came into the office from your current site or you were on the home office. Now, rather than leading by examples, the leadership at, at the partner level were very reluctant to embrace this vision that they put forth. And there was a misalignment in terms of their actions versus what was mandated for everybody else. As <clears throat> any questions? All right, Caroline. Okay, thank you, Amit. Yeah. So the leaders having high self-awareness and understanding what it is that they have as fears or as concerns and, and needing to understand how they are showing up, as Amit said, falls into a little bit too of what we call organizational alignment, which is now the coherence between, it's one thing to have the executive team or the management team aligned and then we also need to understand how this is impacting other teams within the organization. There's often been a um, unfortunate uh, dilemma that middle managers are caught in. They're often what we call the meat and the sandwich in that they're given directives from up top and they also have pressure from people who they lead to, to respond to those needs. And they're often not brought into something in a very meaningful way. So, when we talk about change emotional intelligence and a holistic framework, it's bringing people in as quickly as possible. So yes, you need that alignment at the top. You need to strategically understand where you're going, have that coherence, the leadership capacity to do so, and then quickly ensure that everyone else within the organization also has a place and, and a say and, and in a meaningful way. So not something that's dictated through a memo or an email uh, a week before something is going to happen to someone. It also talks about how do we align the organizational structures, processes, and so on, so that they actually can um, leverage this transformation. And I'm going to give you another example. So recently, again, a client who was going from, I mentioned earlier, the siloed and hierarchical approach to one of more matrix and team-based and yet all of their performance management was based on individual performance. So this was clearly a barrier because how do you tell people, we want you to start collaborating, working across silos, working with teams, being more uh, cooperative. And yet when I come to sit down with my leader, what you ask me about is my individual performance. What you ask me about is my contribution. So now you've created an incoherence. The transformation speaks of a culture of collaboration. The process speaks of an individual culture. So this is something that is gonna absolutely create drag in your transformation. Do your policies follow suit to what you speak of? 
Do your processes, do you have the right tools in place? One other example that came up with this client was they had systems that were very myopic. And what I mean by that is they weren't open view. So people had their own fiefdoms when it came to, to their parts of uh, data. People could not see other people's data. So that does not um, induce collaboration. So even at the level of systems, do you have the systems in place that will actually leverage your transformation? If not, again, you're creating drag. You're creating a, um, a, an excuse for the transformation to not be effective. <clears throat> Has anyone ever experienced that, where you're asked to do one thing, but everything around you just really speaks something different? Does anyone have any experience or story of that during a change process? You've all had great change processes. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'll move on to... I'm not going to say last, but, but the, the, the final pillar for, for the framework, which is what we call employee alignment. And this is something that, again, is, it's not that it's number four. And I want to be clear that even though we say it's really critical to start with strategic and cultural alignment, it does not mean that the other things are not actually all happening in motion, even simultaneously. Because again, there's no real parallel to be done here. Uh, systems are not that neat. Systems are complex and they're messy. And what you will often see are models that try to bring a real neatness to things. And that's been the frustration that we had experienced uh, over the years is there's no such thing because organizations are living, living, uh, living things. They don't operate from a nice, neat framework. So you have to be able to work with all these components, more or less, almost all at once, if you will. So that being said, and when we talk about employee alignment, this is really about our ability to create conditions that allow for engagement. Create meaningful forums and opportunities for employees to get involved in not just being told what the vision is and told what it is that's going to happen to them, but make them meaningful participants. We know for a fact, studies and all the research and all the work we've experienced firsthand, the more engaged people are in co-creating, the more, the more they own something, the more it will stick. No one likes to be force-fed something. So when you engage people in something that is meaningful, the opportunity of it sticking is much, much higher. So an example here um, would be as you're starting to craft where you're going within your initiative is go get some data, some real data from the field as we speak. Because people who do the work are the ones who know the work best. Bring them in, whether you're doing dialogue forums, feedback loops, ask them. Tell them what you're thinking. See how they respond. Co-create with them. It might mean you've got to go back and adjust the vision, but that's, again, the whole idea that it's a living system. Unfortunately, this is where a lot of organizations have difficulty is understanding that organizations are complex and chaos and complexity is always there. Um, so that means sometimes you have to go back and recreate something. That's the challenge sometimes in organizations is we don't have a lot of patience for that. We want the quick fix. We want something to happen now. And we don't necessarily think about how it may impact in the future. The experience we've often seen is employees find out, like we mentioned earlier, maybe if we're lucky a couple of weeks before something is about to hit, and they're told that they're going to have training. And somehow that's supposed to be a magic bullet. We're going to give them training on whatever it is that we feel they need to learn. And that somehow that's going to help them engage and embrace the change. In our experience, that has never, never been effective. It's not meaningful. Um, first of all, just asking someone to go learn something that is, let's say, a new system or a new process doesn't mean I've helped them shift a mindset that I've helped them learn a new behavior. 
that they fully understand what the new culture is that is needed in order to make this transition a real effective uh, process. So employee alignment is as if not more important than all the others because at the end of the day, yes, leadership is, is key and will be the ones to guide, but employees in any organization generally make up the larger bulk of an organization than the leadership. So it's great to have your leadership aligned, but if you can't move all the people underneath that structure, then your initiative is not going to go very far. So, yes. I'll just add one more thing that by, through the employee alignment, we empower the employees as well, thus bringing about uh, accountability and responsibility and a personal uh, vested interest in seeing that the organizational transformation or a specific change is successful. Right. Uh, yes. uh, often used term skin in the game. You know, once they believe that they have skin in the game, they are more ready and the desire for changing is far greater than otherwise. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that is what we wanted to show you for today is at least the, um, the components, the high level um, understanding of the framework and to understand a little bit of the context behind uh, what fuels or what feeds the framework. And now we're open to, we would love to hear your questions, your comments. Um, I, I see one question here that has come in through the chat, and the question is, do you take into consideration alignment with personal values? That's a really good question. So I just want to be sure that I'm understanding it, though. When you're asking about the alignment with personal values, are you talking about at the leadership alignment level or at the strategic level or throughout? Maybe if you can just either. Okay, let's see. Um, at the employee level. Ah, okay. So that's where I think um, it's a very good question. So, so the reality is if people don't feel like it does connect to their personal values, and it goes back to a little bit about the skin in the game, so when people join an organization, hopefully they somewhat believe in what that organization is doing um, and what that organization is about. But that's not always the case. Sometimes people just join an organization because, well, it's a job, it's, it's a place to be. And if the organization is very serious about culture, then yes, they should be looking at how closely aligned are the values of people to the organization and the organization to people. And that's an interesting one because we've often had people ask us, well, do, who creates the values in an organization? Is it the leaders and then they push the values down on people or are values co-created? And I mean, I guess it depends on your philosophy. We like to believe in, in co-creation. Um, doesn't always work. Not every organization has the ability to um, do this massive co-creation of values. But I think that the more you can do that, the more it will help with employee alignment. What we often have seen too in organizations is as you go through a transformation, I've seen both leaders and employees say, I no longer align to where the organization is going and I need to part ways. And that's a difficult thing sometimes in organizations because um, sometimes people have been there 10, 15, 20 years, and then they ask themselves, do I still share these values? And those are conversations that are very difficult. Um, not, every not every leader, I've had many conversations with leaders who are sometimes not willing to accept that people aren't aligning to those values. Um, sometimes we see employees self-select out if they don't feel that it longer suits them. And or sometimes the organization decides that we've given you every opportunity 
to shift and to, to change. And if it's not something that you feel you align with, then we need to part ways. So I don't know if I've answered the question properly and, and maybe Amit, you would like to interject? Yeah. For, for me, I think you've covered some points and, but the nature of the culture of the company um, actually defines some of these values, right? So as the culture evolves, the company evolves, the personal values that, that you came with also may evolve as you go with the company. Mm. So getting that alignment uh, is an ongoing process. There is no one size fits all, right? No. It's not at a particular point. And as the company evolves, deals with different challenges on a global scale, it may have to change its culture. For instance, you know, for piggybacking on the example that you gave uh, earlier on, Caroline, is where you have a organization that is metrics heavily, uh, uh, how do I put it, has a number of uh, organizational hierarchical levels. And if you mm -hmm. want to go to a flat organization, now all of a sudden, the levels that you have are tapered down. You know, the mm -hmm. title that you have are tapered down. So if you are a person who values a high title and a, you know, and a window office, mm -hmm. no longer maybe a, you know, that may not be part of the solution when you're thinking about a flat organization and maybe even, you know, uh, cubicles to work. Mm -hmm. Right. So it is a complicated one because the alignment between values and, and organizations is one that, like you say, Amit, it is complex and it does evolve. And I think it's an ongoing dialogue. Um, the question that came also on, on the heels of that is what about at leadership level? Wouldn't that be critical? Oh, 100%. Um, and actually, as I mentioned earlier, when I was... Um, with a group of clients recently and we were talking about the alignment of, of where the organization was going actually the big 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 conversation we had that lasted at least a workshop and a half was around values and leaders were having to do some personal work to be able to at least think about their personal values and what those values meant in an organizational setting and how well aligned they were to where the organization was heading. Um, these are conversations that can't just happen, in my experience anyways, in, in a, an hour or two, because this is where we talk about more at the human level now. It's, it's aligning an organization to the humans that work in it. So, but definitely, if your leaders cannot espouse the values that are, are shared or that are, are developed together, then of course there's a problem. And a decision will have to be made as to how do we rectify this, this um, incoherence. We have another question. Is there a silver bullet to get employee engagement in a highly politicized environment where even leadership is not aligned? <sighs> Amit, do you want to take that one? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that is a rather difficult question to just answer in a couple of minutes. But, you know, for, for me... It, it all comes back to the strategic and cultural alignment, you know, meaning which defines the values of the company and whether or not the leaders are then subsequently aligned to the values of what the company is striving at. You know, the emotional intelligence, I think, is a key component as well as whole system thinking is a key element in getting these alignments right. You know, in politicized environment where people have their own FIFA systems, more often than not, you're, you're crossing a landmine until you get the leaderships to agree yeah. that, uh, you know, that there is a greater good rather than individual good. So let's talk about the organization as a whole and what's good for it versus what's good for just for me as an individual or my line of business until that barrier is broken down and there's a comprehensive understanding in philosophies of, of how you get there for the greater good rather than individual good, uh, this becomes a, a rather difficult and tricky problem to solve. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, again, I think, Amit, you and I have talked about this at uh, some length around the notion of 
if leaders are not aligned, can the rest of the organization try to initiate change? Can change happen from somewhere else in the organization? And I'm honestly of two minds around that because in whole system thinking, you would believe that you can sort of draw the system at different places. So in other words, maybe you bind the system saying, okay, we're going to try to influence or work with middle managers and that we're going to try to create momentum at that level in the organization. And then from there, we can try to create an upward push. Um, I mean, that's maybe my utopic belief. I don't know. And I would love to see examples where it's actually worked. Um, the, the only it's time I've challenging. Seen, yes, go ahead, Amit. The only time I've seen that work is when there's a purge, you know, the executive, uh -huh. the significant shift in the entire executive suite. So, you know, the CEO is pushed out for non performance or what have you, and with him, uh, some of his entourage are put to pasture, and then comes in a new CEO that helps bring new strategic values and a new culture within the company. That's the only time I've seen this work successfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If not, people are so mired within their own ways of doing things that they become desensitized to the other chatter in the room, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But I do believe there is momentum that can be gained because I have seen where in certain parts, uh, you know, I'm thinking of one client right now where uh, change was initiated by different parts of the organization because they did get a group of managers together. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, they had decided that they were frustrated with something and that they wanted a change. So what they did was they collected enough uh, momentum within their level. I hate that word, but within their level of the organization. And together they went in front of the, their, their upper management and they actually were able to make some significant change on this one issue that had been quite um, bothersome to, to a lot of their teams. So anything is possible, but I think like Amit said, it's a hard question to answer in just a few minutes. Uh, there's another question we have, um, and I'm not fully sure I understand. How about new management impact? So I'm wondering, uh, does the question relate to meaning new people who come into the organization? Um, if you can give me some insight as to maybe a little bit more clarification so that I can try to answer that. Um, another question we have is if you are only working with a subsystem and not really having access to the executive level, how can this framework support the holistic view of the change process? Is it still possible to create a holistic and systemic change? I think this is an interesting question. Yeah. Right? It depends upon certain factors, specifically the sphere of influence of change that the change sponsor has and the corporate culture. So I think this is a yes, no answer. Mm -hmm. Do you want to give a little bit more on that? Sure. You know, Yes, it is possible if the whole system comprises of many microsystems where uh, the impact of each subsystem is understood by the chain sponsor and he has the ability to influence the owners of the other subsystems uh, to collaborate based upon definite data that they have in terms of positive, uh, the positive impacts that the change transformation has provided thus yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it also is conducive, you know, it's totally conducive uh, uh, to the culture of the company as well. For instance, in the, if it's highly, polit uh, if there are FIFTA systems and it's politicized, more likely than not, it's not going to work because each individual owner of the subsystem is going to try to protect his or her turf. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And that, so, yeah. And a little bit like what we were saying earlier, sometimes in whole systems, what you can do is bind a certain part of the system, see what you can impact there. And, you know, even if you can't change the whole system, um, I'm a huge believer in at least influence what you can in the areas you do have impact on. So maybe you won't be able to create a whole system shift, 
But again, it's how do you define the system? Maybe the system is the, the unit you work in. Maybe the system is the department or even just the team that you work in. If something is not working for you that needs a change, then bind the system to the people who are most impacted by this, this need for change. So you may have to start smaller. And maybe you're going to need whoever is most influential within the system that you've bound, rather than thinking that it's going to have to be a large, massive um, transformation. Change can be in smaller units as well. Absolutely. So um, the question that was asked earlier, um, there's been a little bit more clarity brought in. It's uh, what if a fixer is brought in to completely shake up the current system? And by fixer, I, I don't know if we mean that um, the person's come in to shake up the organization and, and to maybe bring some new thinking. If I'm reading it properly, if that's what is intended by it, um, see, that's interesting. I'd have to question, well, why did they feel the need um, to come on, to bring on a, a so-called fixer? What is that all about? So it, I'd need to understand... Um, a little bit more about that context, and I'd be happy to have an offline conversation about it. Um, can always have a chat afterwards. Um, so that being said, I see there's a hand up by Cindy. Cindy, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, hi. I, uh, hi. I wanted to know, when is the right time to um, involve the employees? Because I've seen situations yeah. where leadership will use code names when they're talking about a change. Uh -huh. And they build their change management plan that's, you know, all inclusive and then they roll it out. And I've seen also situations where they're very open and transparent about all potential changes to come or ideas even that are out there. Mm -hmm. And it has caused a lot of anxiety uh, amongst the employees. Yeah. So we're not in a high EI world. Right. When is the right time to involve the employees? Yes. Personally, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and I've heard this argument, if you will, about, well, we don't want to say too much until we know more and we need to have the, the answers. But the reality is um, people don't necessarily need all the answers to be involved. They want to co-create. But to your point about the anxiety, how do we manage that? I really truly believe it's by engagement. What causes anxiety is when we create uh, communication vacuums. Because people aren't stupid. They start sensing. They know something's happening. But then the rumor mill begins. And people start that water cooler talk. And then it's not necessarily validated messages. It's just messaging that people make up. That's what causes a lot of anxiety. And they hear, they know people are behind closed doors having meetings. Again, I think that we can't underestimate the fact that people are not, they're not stupid. They quickly understand that something's happening and they also quickly understand that they're not being told anything. So I've always been a big believer of the sooner the better. Um, and I don't mean that you bring them in at a point where it's completely premature and you don't know that you're actually engaging in something. But once you know you're embarking, um, I mean, we've seen way too many situations where there is at least a year between takeoff and when employees get engaged. Personally, in my estimate, that's a long runway. <laughs> that's too long of a runway. <clears throat> so to your point, I don't know what the perfect time is, but I think that it's, it's got to be sooner rather than later. I, I completely uh, agree with you, uh, Caroline. You know, once the water cooler conversation starts taking place and the rumor mill starts, then unfortunately the organizational transformation team has to go into a, uh, how do I put it, you know, a, uh, a very defensive posture. You know, it's, it's in terms of it's damage control mode. Yeah. Right? And then the trust that you need to engage the employees and to have them being willing participants and advocates for the change goes away. Uh, I can give you an example. I've recently worked on a merger acquisition and diversiture of two big, with two big biopharma companies. The way the employees found out that their company was actually first going to be going through a divestiture is by reading it in fine print on Wall Street Journal. Mm. Needless to say, that had a significant impact on the trust that the employees had 
with the executives and it created a very toxic work environment in, work, in which people did not trust each other as their jobs were on the line. Because as you know, when you have diversity and such, you don't know what the future holds for you. The sad part is that transformation was a very painful one and we lost a lot of key people with subject matter expertise because they decided to bail a lot earlier than when we would have ideally liked them to. Hmm. I am mindful of the time and I do appreciate that we did say one to two. Um, so I, I do want to be mindful of that. And um, I do invite you, if you do have questions offline, to please um, email either myself, uh, Carolyn, C A R O L I N E, at thepillars.ca, or Amit, if you're open to emails as well. Absolutely. My email address is Amit, A M I T, dot Patel, at mythosgroupinc.com. And we will be sending out um, the recording of today's session along with the slides. We do hope to do a future uh, webinar where we would go into more depth to be able to give you more meat about the how. You know, how do you get this alignment? How do you get this engagement? How do you do this? What kind of methods have we been using to bring this framework into, uh, into practice? So thank you very much for your engagement, your time, and for your great questions. And uh, we look forward to having you with us again. So I yeah, wish you all a great day. And thank you, Amit. Uh, thank you all as well. All and right. thank you, Caroline, for hosting. Okay. Thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye.